The main purpose of yesterday's lecture was to gain insight into all the various complicated explanations concerning initially what we ought to regard as matter, as materiality. We saw matter, materiality as burst spiritual forms, pulverized spiritual forms. In the context of these lectures, it has been our task to point out to the essential nature of physical existence from this angle, because as human beings we are enveloped in this material existence. Bursting spiritual form has entered into us and filled us entirely. The expulsion from paradise is an apt symbolic depiction of this permeating of the human being with earthly matter. If you followed what was being said yesterday, not only in concepts but also by experiencing it to some extent, you will have reached a conception of how we as human beings are to some extent twofold beings. Consider what we said the day before yesterday about how the Luciferic influence made it possible for the human being to have introduced into him the kind of sense perceptions we possess here in our earthly existence. We pointed out that these earthly sense perceptions were not initially intended for us since we should have had a way of living with the all-pervading will and that the way we now hear through our ears, see through our eyes and perceive through our other sense organs is in fact a deformity that has come about through the Luciferic influence. We also then, more from, more within the human being, pointed out how secretions from the glands came about through a displacement of the members of the human organization. And finally, we attributed the normal working of the organs, nutrition and all processes of substances within the human body to a kind of preponderance of the astral body over the activity of the ether body, a preponderance which had also come about through the Luciferic influence. This is what we arrived at the day before yesterday. In other words, all the coarse material processes, the nutritional and digestive processes, and so on, the processes of glandular secretion, and also the processes of sense perception, are, in the way they exist in us today, attributable to the influence of Lucifer. And yesterday we saw from another angle that we also owe to the Luciferic influence the nerve material, the matter of which nerves are made, and the same applies to muscular matter and also bone matter. Let us now look again at this twofold human being. On one hand we owe sense perceptions, glandular activity, and the whole organic process of metabolism to the Luciferic influence. And on the other hand, it is also to the Luciferic influence that we owe the existence of the nerves, the muscular system, and the bony system. So how do these two human beings behave? The being of the senses, glands, and digestion on the one hand, and on the other hand, the being of the nerves, the muscles, and the bones. What is the cosmic, the universal task of these two in the way they are coupled together in human nature. There is not even any need of spiritual insight in order to notice that everything connected with our senses, our glandular activity and our digestive system is basically transient or immediately perishable when it takes place within the human being. These are things which, by his very nature, the human being leaves behind him. It is obvious that there is no eternal purpose involved in our carrying out these organic activities. You need only examine briefly what science or our daily life teaches us before you say, as instruments of digestion and nourishment, we are harnessed to life in a decidedly dreadful manner, for this is a wheel which turns forever in the same way. 
unless you consider it great progress when someone, perhaps over years, develops preferences for new foods or drinks which he did not enjoy earlier on, you cannot help declaring, there is very little forward progress in this ever-churning treadmill of eating and digesting and so on. It is repeated over and over again in the same way, and hardly anyone will be likely even to dream that this activity gives us human beings any special value for eternity. In the same way, glandular secretion too has fulfilled its purpose as soon as it has taken place. Of course, it is important for the organism as a whole, but it certainly has no value for eternity. And, since sense impressions come and go, the same also applies to perception by means of the senses. You need only consider how pale, even after just a few days, a sense impression has become, how much it differs from the memory of the sense perception you experienced, how very different the memory is from the sense perception. And you will not fail to realize that however beautiful sensory perceptions are, however much pleasure your observation of them provides, they have no value for eternity. Where is the value which arose out of the sense impressions you had as a child or a young person? Where is it all, whatever it was that approached you through eyes or ears? How pale are those memories? When you consider that, in so far as he is a creature of glands and digestion, the human being gains no value for eternity through these activities. When you consider this, you will now find it easy to connect this thought with the general description we gave yesterday, because unfortunately only brief hints can be given in short lectures, namely the idea of the bursting, shattering form. As form spurts into these activities, thus, so to speak, providing the organism with collapsing form, that is, with matter, it does so in such a way that the activity of the senses, the secretion of the glands, and the activity of digestion comes about. And this shows us vividly that here we are confronted with form which is breaking up, form which is shattering into pieces, in the activity of the senses and the secretion of the glands and in the activity of digestion we are presented with specific processes of the disintegration of form. These are specific processes within whatever we describe in general as the process of the disintegration of form or as the spurting of form into matter. If we now turn to nerve activity to muscle activity and to the working of the bones, the existence of the bones in the human being, we are confronted with an entirely different situation. Yesterday we mentioned that the bony system, in a way, contains imagination brought into matter, that the muscular system, in its movement, contains inspiration brought into matter and that the nervous system contains intuition brought into matter. We now come to something that has been discussed only approximately in more general lectures on spiritual science, and that is the way in which, when the human being passes through the portal of death, his bony system disintegrates, whether through decomposition, through cremation, or by any other means. But what remains when the bony system disintegrates physically is imagination. The imagination is not lost. It remains in those substances which we also have within us when we have passed through the portal of death and are entering into Kamaloka or Devakan. We retain an image configuration, although when this is viewed by a thoroughly schooled clairvoyant it does not very much resemble our skeleton. But when a less highly trained clairvoyant allows this to work on him, he, see, he does see in this image configuration an outward resemblance to the human bony system, 
which is why it is not so wrong to depict death in the image of a skeleton, even though this derives from an unschooled, yet not entirely inappropriate, clairvoyance. Also included in imagination is what is left of the muscles once they have disintegrated physically. Inspiration remains, of which the muscles are merely an expression, because they are really only inspirations permeated with materiality. So we retain inspiration when we have passed through the portal of death. This is very interesting. And we also retain an intuition of the nervous system when the nerves themselves are approaching their disintegration after death. All these aspects are true constituents of our astral and our ether bodies. As you know, we do not entirely discard our ether body, for we carry an extract of the ether body with us after having passed through the portal of death. And this is not all. As we go on our way through the world, we carry our nervous system with us. And this nervous system is nothing other than intuition permeated with matter. As we carry this nervous system about with us, there is at those points where the nerves are interspersed throughout our body a continuous presence of intuition. And from this intuition, spirituality streams forth which permanently surrounds us like an aura. So as we pass through the portal of death, it is not only a matter of what we take with us, for there is, in addition, also this intuition which streams forth in proportion to the disintegration of the nerves. There is within us a permanent process of disintegration. We are constantly in need of reconstruction whereby the durability is greatest in the case of the nervous system, and there is a constant streaming out which can only be perceived through intuition. We can therefore say, substance that can be perceived through intuition, spiritual substance, constantly streams forth from the human being in the same measure as his physical nervous system disintegrates. So we can see that as he makes use of his physical nervous system, wearing it out, causing it to disintegrate, the human being is not without significance for the world. Indeed, he is very significant for it, since the substances perceptible to intuition, which stream forth from him, depend on the uses to which he puts his nerves. And similarly, as the human being makes use of his muscles, substances perceptible to inspiration stream forth from him. And that which beams forth in this way constantly populates the world with all kinds of exceedingly differentiated movement processes. Thus substances stream forth that are perceptible to inspiration. This way of expressing it is inadequate, but we have no other. And from the bones of the human being substance streams forth that can be perceived through imagination. This now is especially interesting. I do not want to overfeed you with the results of clairvoyant research, but this is truly interesting, namely that through the raying out from the bones as they disintegrate, the human being everywhere leaves behind him, as it were, images, spiritual pictures perceptible to imagination. Delicate shadow pictures are left behind by us wherever we have been. As you depart from this hall, you will leave behind you on the seats delicate shadow images, which for a while will remain perceptible to a more subtle, well-trained clairvoyance until the general processes of the universe absorb them. Delicate shadow images, which have streamed forth from your skeletal system, will be left behind by each one of you. It is such imaginations which bring about those uncomfortable inklings we sometimes experience upon entering a room where someone else, some disagreeable person, has been. This is mainly due to the imaginations he has left behind. We still find him there in a kind of shadow image. A sufficiently sensitive person 
is no less capable in this respect than a clairvoyant, for he senses the unpleasantness left behind in a room by someone else. The clairvoyant merely has the added ability to describe what the sensitive person only surmises. What, then, becomes of everything that radiates from us? Taken all in all, dear friends, we can say that there are emanations from everything we do in the world. Whenever you are doing something or going around you, I'll read that again, whenever you are doing something or going around, you are bringing your system of bones and muscles into movement. Indeed, even while you are lying down and thinking about something, you radiate substance that can be detected through intuition. In short, with every activity, you constantly send something out into the world. If these processes did not take place, there would be nothing left of the earth once it reached its goal apart from pulverized matter, which would pass over into the rest of the universe in the form of dust. But whatever human beings rescue out of the material processes of the earth continues to live on in the general cosmos, in the universal world, in all that comes into being through intuition, inspiration, and imagination. Thus human beings give back to the world the building bricks needed for rebuilding itself. All this will live on as the spirit and soul of the whole earth once its material aspect disintegrates like a corpse in the same way as individual human souls live on in spirit once the individual has passed through the portal of death. The human being conveys his own soul through the portal of death, and the earth conveys across to the Jupiter existence all that has arisen out of the intuitions, inspirations, and imaginations of human beings. In this way we have characterized the great difference between the one part and the other part of the human being, insofar as he is a twofold being. The part which grasps hold of sense perceptions, which secretes through glands, and which digests and nourishes itself, this is the human being destined to bring about all that is cleft and riven in the temporal realm. But whatever is developed through the existence of the nervous, muscular, and bony systems is incorporated into the earth so that it may be enabled to continue in existence. We are now approaching the mystery, which is a part of our overall existence. And being a mystery, it cannot really be grasped by our intellect. It needs to be believed and penetrated, and it is nonetheless true. That which human beings are capable of sending out into their surroundings is clearly composed of a duality. There is one part of inspiration, intuition, and imagination, upon which general cosmic existence depends and which it absorbs. General cosmic existence accepts this part, but there is another part which it does not accept, which it rejects. The general cosmos declares, yes, I can do with these inspirations, intuitions, and imaginations. These I can accept in order to carry them over into the Jupiter existence. But others are rejected by it. It does not accept them. And as a result, those intuitions, inspirations, and imaginations are not accepted anywhere and thus come to a halt. They remain spiritually within the cosmos and cannot be absorbed. Thus, what rays out from us falls into two parts, into one part which the cosmos is glad to accept and another which it rejects, which it finds unacceptable and does not take up. This latter part is left standing. How long does it remain standing? It remains standing there until the human being comes and destroys it himself by means of emitting what is capable of destroying it. And as a rule, only the one who has created it is capable of emitting what will destroy it. Here we have the practicality of karma. Here we have the reason why we are obliged to encounter once again 
during the course of our karma, all those imaginations, inspirations, and intuitions that have been rejected by the cosmos. It is up to us to destroy them, because the cosmos only accepts what is correct in thinking, beautiful in feeling, and good in morality. It rejects everything else. That is the mystery. And whatever is wrong in thinking, ugly in feeling, and bad or evil in morality must be expunged from existence by the human being himself through thoughts, feelings, and impulses of will, or by deeds, if it is not to continue to exist. Such things will pursue him until he manages to expunge them. We have thus reached the point where we are shown how untrue it is that the cosmos consists only of neutral laws of nature or expresses itself only through neutral laws of nature. The cosmos all around us, which we believe ourselves capable of comprehending through our senses and our intellect, possesses quite other forces. It is, we could say, a stern repudiator of what is evil, ugly, or false and it is keen to take in the good, the beautiful, and the true. The powers that be in the cosmos do not sit in judgment only at certain times. Sitting in judgment is something they do constantly throughout the whole of earthly evolution. We are now able to answer the question, what is the overall situation with regard to the development of the human being in relation to the higher spiritual beings? We have seen that on the one hand, the human being of the senses, the glands, and the digestion can be said to have arisen through the Luciferic influence. But to some extent, we can also attribute the other human being to that same Luciferic influence. Whereas the former is the human being of deterioration, destined only for temporal existence, The latter has the task of saving what is human for eternity, for all duration, taking it across to a later existence. It is the task of the man of nerves, muscles, and bones to carry across what human beings experience on the earth. We conclude from this basically that man has fallen from spiritual heights to having become the first type the human being of senses, glands, and digestion, and that he will gradually be enabled to work his way up again into spiritual existence through having received the counterbalance of nerves, muscles, and bones. The strange thing, however, is that this separating out of intuitive, inspired, and imaginative substance can only take place because the processes of matter represent destructive processes. If our nerves, if our muscles, if our bones were not constantly deteriorating, if they were to remain as they are, then we would be unable to separate this off, for it is only through deterioration on the one side, as expressed in material existence, that the flashing up, the lighting up of the spirit can come about. If our nerves, our muscles, and our bones were unable to deteriorate and finally fall prey to death, then we would be condemned to exist only within the earth as it is, without being able to participate in further development toward the future. We would participate in a rigid, petrified present time, lacking any development towards a future. The forces that play their part both in the one kind and in the other kind of human existence, are indeed two forces that balance one another out. And between the two, as though mediating between them, we have that substance, that form of matter, about which we have spoken more often in connection with general aspects of spiritual science, but less often in the present context. It is blood, which mediates between the two and which is also in this context, quote, a juice of rarest quality, close quote. We have seen that as far as the substance of the nerves and so on is concerned, it has come to work in the way it does through the Luciferic influence. But with the blood, the situation 
is that the very substance itself is what fell prey to the Luciferic influence. As we saw the way in which physical body, ether body and astral body collaborate with one another would have been different if no Luciferic influence had occurred. In these cases there are certain supersensible aspects which take up the physical matter and only then, through the Luciferic influence, make it what it has become. Nerve, muscle and bone substances come into being as a result of certain bodies in the human being not combining together in the right way. Lucifer has no influence on the substances as such because these substances do not arise until he has, as it were, brought the arrangement of the bodies into disorder. Wherever Lucifer has approached the human being, he has brought about this disorder. But his influence on the blood, on the matter, the very substance of the blood itself, has been direct. Blood is a juice of rarest quality because it is the only physical substance which, as such, manifests that in its very nature it is not as it ought to have been in the human being of today if there had been no Luciferic interference. Blood has become something entirely different from what it should have been. This is grotesque, is it not? But it is so. Let us remind ourselves of how matter came into being. We said that matter arises when spiritual form reaches a certain boundary and then shatters, so that this pulverized form represents matter. This earthly matter shows itself like this only in its mineral form, since the other substances are changed in other ways. Blood is the exceptional substance. Originally, blood as a substance was also intended to reach down to a specific boundary of form. Here, and there's a picture, you see the purely spiritual form rays of the blood, and here its strength would have been exhausted. But according to its original tendency, the blood was not supposed to spray out into space. Here at the boundary it was to have become just a little bit like matter before spraying back into itself, before spraying directly back into the spiritual. This is how blood was originally intended to be. If if I may put it more bluntly, blood would have reached only as far as forming a thin skin where matter begins so that it would emerge from the spiritual only momentarily, becoming only slightly physically perceptible before darting back into the spiritual and being received there by the spiritual realm. Blood was intended to become like a continual flowing out and darting back into the spiritual. This is the predisposition of blood. It should have been a continual lighting up into matter while remaining entirely spiritual. This is what it would have become if, at the beginning of earthly evolution, human beings had received their capital I solely from the spirits of form. They would then have sensed their I by the resistance which this momentary shining out in the blood signifies. In this shining out in the blood, the human being would have sensed the I am, and this would have been the organ for perceiving his I. It would have been his sole sensory perception since the others would not have come about if everything had run its course without the Luciferic influence. Readers aside, when I said perceiving his eye, I also meant capital I. And readers aside. This would have amounted to living with the all-pervading will. What had been intended for the human being was that his one sensory perception should have consisted in perceiving his capital I in the shining out of the blood substance and its immediate darting back into the spiritual. The intention was that instead of seeing colors, hearing sounds, experiencing tastes, the human being would live in the all-pervading will. It should have been like floating in the all-pervading will. What was intended for him was that having been placed into the spiritual world as pure imagination, inspiration and intuition, he would look down from there 
at a being on the earth or in its vicinity. But he would not feel, I am enclosed within that being. Instead he would feel, I look down and perceive something which belongs to me. The one and only thing of matter shines out to me, that which is spiritual blood becoming matter. It is in this that I perceive my eye. The only perception to be experienced through the senses should have been the perception of the capital I, and the only substance intended for the human being in the realm of matter would have been blood in the form of that momentary shining forth. If this is what the human being would have become by remaining the human being of paradise, looking down out of the universe upon what had been intended to symbolize him on this earth, then a purely spiritual being, consisting of imaginations, inspirations, and intuitions, would have experienced the momentary shining out of the blood as his eye. In that momentary shining forth, the human being would then have been able to say, I am, for down there I am bringing into being something which is a part of me. It is remarkable that we can really say, Actually, the human being was destined to live in the environs of the earth. A human being living here in the environs of the earth, and there's a picture, was to have created his own mirror image on the earth in order, through that momentary shining forth, to beam back his eye and say, Down there is the manifestation of me. It was not supposed to be the case that the human being has to carry around with him his man of bones, muscles, and nerves, his man of glands. Nor should it have been necessary constantly to form the grotesque judgment, this is what I am. Something different should have come about. The human being should have lived in the environ, in environs of the earthly planet, engraving his sign upon the earth through the shining out of the blood form, saying, Here I drive in my stake, my seal, and my sign, which gives me awareness of my eye. With what I have become through the Saturn, through the Sun, and through the Moon existences, I float out here in the universal all. All I need then do is add the eye, which I perceive as I inscribe myself down there. Then I can always read that that which I am in the shining forth of the blood. Yes, indeed, it was not originally intended that we should walk about in bodies made of bones and flesh as we do. We should have been circling the earth while making signs down there through which to recognize that this is who we are, that what we are is an I. Those who do not take this into account cannot know the being of man. Lucifer then came and brought it about that the human being should not only know his eye as a sense perception, but should also experience as his eye everything he had already possessed on moon as his astral body, thinking, feeling, and will. His eye was mixed together with these. But this made it necessary for the human being to descend into matter. The first consequence of this was the change in the blood, which then no longer shone out for a moment before being taken back into spirituality. Instead the substance of the blood pressed in and burst forth. It became something which bursts forth and shatters. Thus the substance of the blood, which ought to return to the spiritual realm as soon as it becomes material, now spurts out into the rest of the human being, filling his whole organization and becoming transformed in compliance with the forces in that organization. Depending on whether it penetrates into a preponderance, let's say, of the physical body over the ether body or of the ether body over the astral body and so on, it turns into substance of nerves, the substance of muscles and so on. In this way, Lucifer forced the blood into a coarser substantiality. Whereas blood was intended to shine forth briefly as matter and then immediately disappear again, Lucifer forced it to enter into coarser materiality. 
This is the direct achievement of Lucifer, transforming blood into matter. At least with the other members, he only brought about disorder. Blood would not exist at all in the way it does now. It would, in its spirituality, only come close to the border with matter in statu nascendi, before immediately pulling back again. In its present material form, blood is a luciferic creation. And because the human being now has the physical expression of his eye in his blood, this human being is, here on earth, linked through his eye with Lucifer's creation. And since, moreover, it became possible for Araman to approach the human being after Lucifer had been there first, we can say, Lucifer threw down the blood so that Araman could catch it. So, now, both of them are able to lay hold of the human being. Need we be surprised that according to an age-old tradition, Lucifer Araman regards blood as his own earthly possession? Is it surprising that he expects contracts to be signed in blood, that he coerces Faust into signing the contract with him in his own blood? Blood is out and out his very own by right. Everything else contains some element of the divine and makes him feel uncomfortable. For Lucifer, even ink is more divine than blood, which is his very own element. We have seen that the human being consists of two parts, the man of senses, glands and digestion, and the man of nerves, muscles and bones. In their coarse materiality, both of these parts are supplied with suitable forces by what blood has become through the Luciferic influence. Even from external science we can learn that insofar as he is a physical being, man is entirely the outcome of his blood. All physical matter in the human being is nourished by his blood. He is transformed blood. Insofar as they consist of physical matter, the bones, nerves, muscles, glands, indeed all the parts, are transformed blood. Actually, the human being is blood, and insofar as he is blood, he is the living Lucifer Araman himself. He carries Lucifer with him all the time. Only in what he has within him, which is beyond what the blood has given him, does the human being also belong to the divine worlds to ongoing evolution which does not remain retarded. Lucifer came into the world through having become backward at a certain level of development, and the same goes for Araman. When we examine what has just been described, we shall be able to say, from the beginning of earthly evolution, human beings possessed something which they shared, they had something very much in common in their blood. Namely, if this blood had remained for them what had been intended from the outset, then it would have been a pure emanation from the spirits of form. The spirits of form would have existed in our blood as it originally was. As most of you know, these spirits of form are none other than the seven Elohim of the Bible. You need only leaf through the lectures I gave on Genesis in Munich, and you will discover that if he had retained his blood in the form originally intended, the human being would feel the seven Elohim within him. That is, he would sense his eye to be sevenfold, with the main member corresponding for him with Yahweh or Jehovah, and the other six initially being subsidiary members. If the human being's blood had not been spoilt by Lucifer, this sevenfold entity which he would sense as being his eye, or the seven Elohim, or spirits of form, would have taught him something which we are now with much effort obliged to regain as knowledge of the sevenfold nature of the human being. This is how long humanity, on account of that damaged blood, has had to wait before being able to recognize that a sevenfoldness is involved. This is how long that damaged blood has made us wait before we can become mature enough, thanks to sufficient 
emanations of intuitive, inspirative, and imaginative substance coming from the nerves, muscles, and bones to regain that sevenfoldness of our human nature. Now, we can specify, initially in an abstract form, that nature of the human being, which is brought into play in the eye by the physical body and by the ether body, that nature which is brought into play by the astral body from itself, Yahweh or Jehovah, and also that part which is brought into play by the manas or spirit self, that part which is brought into play by the buddhi or life spirit, and that part which is brought into play by the Atma, or spirit man. But the human being would not have reached a specific darkening of the other six members and a special brightening of the one member, the I, if Lucifer had not been sent in during the course of earthly evolution. At the beginning of earthly evolution, the other members became darkened while the I became bright shining out in its brighter I-ishness. This occurred because in the material sense this I was forced into dense matter so so that it should gain a thorough awareness of being a unity, a singularity, after having initially felt itself to be sevenfold. So we see that if his blood had remained in its original state, the human being would have attained an I which possessed a sevenfold character from the beginning. But because of Lucifer becoming involved, he attained an eye with the characteristic of uniqueness, so that he came to feel and know his eye as the very center of his being. Since the seven Elohim were originally intended to manifest in every human eye, we can now comprehend the blood as something that was originally intended to bring human beings together, to enable them to form a social whole and thus feel themselves as the all-embracing human species. It is due to what Lucifer gave to human beings that they regard themselves as an individual I, as a specific individual, who in his independence is recognizable as being distinct from the overall human species. This shows us that in the universal development of the earth the human being is coming to be led by Lucifer to be increasingly independent, whereas through the seven Elohim he would increasingly come to feel himself as a member of overall humanity. What this implies for morality and the development of human life as a whole will be our subject for tomorrow.